Do not disturb. It always gets me in trouble when I forget to undo it after the talk. Okay, so someone asked for a quick brief on Pipeline AI. Uh, we're a machine learning artificial intelligence platform, uh, mostly focused on real-time uh, model predictions and real-time model training. So the ability to actually make changes to your models throughout the day or as events are happening. So we're very streaming focused. In fact, one of the announcements we'll show later today is we have uh, first class integration with MapR Streams, which is essentially um, an alternate implementation, a drop in replacement for Kafka Streams. And so why would you want to use something other than Kafka? Well, that's up to you. I mean, if you're already using MapR for their distributed file system, um, you, uh, you know, the MapR streams are built on top of um, the, the MapR platform and, you know, has all the high availability. Um, this isn't necessarily an advertisement for MapR, but we actually were quite impressed with, with the functionality and um, it is compatible with uh, the Kafka API, so all of your Kafka code uh, that uses producer consumer, um, just literally you, you install the C equivalent um, to lib Kafka from MapR, and all of a sudden all your Python and Java code can use uh, the uh, MapR streams and MapR file system. So we'll show some examples here in a bit, um, and. But basically, the gist of it is we have one single unified runtime for uh, you know, all ML AI frameworks, for GPUs, for CPUs, and we run across all clouds. So cloud agnostic, um, we target uh, mainly product teams, application teams, and data science teams. And think of us as a way to quickly uh, push out new versions of models at the speed of thought is how we like to say. So basically you, you have a new idea for um, either hyperparameter uh, for your model or possibly a um, like alternate runtime or hyperparameters for your runtime. So we are constantly optimizing not just the models but the actual runtimes that these models run in um, when they're out in live production. So taking our Netflix background, which was very high velocity, you know, changes in production, uh, but safely, and extending this to the data science world. Um, we've got quite a few folks that use either the open source or the product. Um, so we're, you know, very proud to have uh, these folks on our front page here. Also, um, we're hosting a workshop later this week, actually, if you're based in San Francisco, um, and I'm going to record it, too. I always record these things on my laptop and post them. Um, I'm not sure if the conference is, uh, if they actually let me do that, but um, ask for forgiveness um, instead of permission, right? So uh, there's two conferences later this week, which I'll talk about in the blog post that I show here in a sec. Um, also, December of 2018, so last month, we participated in KubeCon, and we had a booth there and got a lot of good connections and made a lot of good um, uh, connections with the KubeFlow folks and um, learned quite a bit about Kubernetes that we, we thought we knew everything, but uh, there's you know always more and more stuff to learn. So that's sort of a quick overview. If you want to take a look at some of the products, click on the products page. Also, community uh, page here has quite a bit. Um, you know, we're we're close to four thousand stars and forks, and or, or I guess combined, we're over four thousand. Slack channel. Um, here's our blog, uh, and all the good stuff here. YouTube videos, and okay. So that's the overview. Let me flip over to. Uh, this link, which is earlier, I posted in the Zoom webinar chat over there. So um, we're excited to announce some new features. Also, uh, kind of the immediate, we've got two free tickets to this deep learning summit here in San Francisco that we would love to give away. So to be eligible, sign up for the community edition. The link is here. It's just community.pipeline.ai. Deploy a sample model. You can follow the quick start. Um, there's also, we're also doing the workshop, like I mentioned, uh, this is only one hour, so we're going to have to blaze through it quickly, but we'll be 
uh, training a model, deploying a model, updating the model live, uh, and seeing those uh, changes. One fun thing that, that we'll be doing uh, is actually using Slack. So we'll be labeling data with Slack. We'll be triggering um, a model deploy with Slack. Um, and uh, yeah, like basically using Slack as our sort of interface into the pipeline system. So um, the other conference coming up this week, uh, I'll be speaking on Wednesday is the Global AI Conference. This is down in Santa Clara. Uh, this is always a good conference. There's always um, you know, quite a few industry uh, folks uh, in the Bay Area, you know, industry leaders that um, you, you can stumble upon and sort of interact with. And it's a very uh, casual uh, conference and, you know, a lot of good content from um, the Bay Area. So check us out there. And so a couple news items here. We're now supporting uh, the Elastic Kubernetes service um, by Amazon. So, th so this was a big step. We had previously been managing our own Amazon, or sorry, our own Kubernetes clusters, um, and finally decided to, to take the plunge. We, we feel these managed Kubernetes services are um, quite a lot further along than they were even six months ago. Uh, they're all around the same version now before there was some disparity in version of Kubernetes that they support, uh, which caused a lot of problems for us, for people that uh, were using um, our product today. So we've been able to successfully migrate over to EKS. It was actually pretty painless. Um, the big thing, of course, is IAM roles uh, and the security, um, you know, uh, uh, right, like subsystems of these specific cloud providers. So we're going to keep iterating and start to do the Azure uh, AKS and then, of course, Google's uh, GKE uh, managed Kubernetes service. Um, you can see there's a link in the, the po in this blog post, this Medium post, uh, that takes you right to uh, how to set it up um, on your own EKS cluster. So, uh, you know, let us know. You'll need access to our uh, Docker repo, and you'll need to be whitelisted into our OAuth system uh, to actually run it. But um, we are working with enterprises uh, to hook into their OAuth mechanisms and also uh, get things into their own Docker registry. So uh, we've got that process nailed down pretty easily. So just contact us, contact that pipeline or Crystal Pipeline. Either way, you'll you'll get to us. Uh, the other big announcement um, is. Better first-class workflows with Airflow on Kubernetes using Pipeline AI. So uh, this is something we have been working on the last couple months. Um, Eric, the intern from Berkeley, actually helped out quite a bit with this. Uh, you know, like get through some of the nuts and bolts and get this set up. Uh, so we have some examples and some links to some some relevant blog posts here. So. Uh, we'll be adding this more into the actual pipeline platform um, this uh, coming month in February, so be looking out for that. Um, but just know right now you can do this today. It's it's just it's more so with the command line than through the actual app itself. So that's something we're going to be changing next month. Um, the third thing is we did get this integration with MapR Streams. Uh, we have a couple customers using MapR. And at first we thought this was gonna be a huge undertaking. Um, and actually we found it to be pretty painless. Uh, like I said, MapR Streams is a drop-in replacement for the most part for Kafka Streams. So you can even use the same Kafka API uh, to connect directly to the MapR Stream. So we found this very, very stable um, and actually gave us a nice little taste of their distributed file system, which is something we've been looking for. Uh, we've previously and are, are still looking at Ceph and Rook. Um, we've had some stability issues that uh, we've been holding off on actually putting that into the product for right now, but we're working with those guys to get that fixed. So here's some links to MapR. Uh, they call it the event store. You know, really it's their streaming uh, technology. Also excited, we've had lots of requests for more uh, samples and you know ways to use pipeline. Um, and so we we picked a nice Keras uh, transfer learning sample. The the blog post that we modeled this after is uh, two links below. Uh, the link right below is actually the exact code that we're using. So we're we're uh, 
We're using MobileNet, um, a model that's been trained um, with, with the MobileNet. And then what we do is we uh, take that model, we, we chop the very last output layer off. So we're not classifying our images with the, the classes that were used to train MobileNet, but we're actually replacing it with um, a simple dog and cat. Uh, really binary classifier. So that's the example there. And, you know, with only, um, <clears throat> we have one version of the model that's, that's not that good, which is only um, transferring, uh, or it, it's only being retrained with one cat image and one dog image, and that's not a very good classifier. It's still in the, you know, 80, 90% uh, like confidence range, but when we train it on even 20 uh, dogs and then 20 cats, uh, the um, uh, like confidence of these predictions goes way up. So the point here is that these models have uh, have been trained already on you know millions of these images. We can now transfer what we've learned over um, to our domain, which we just happen to pick cats and dogs because that's a, a you know common one. Um, and with only you know 20 images of each cat and dog, we can actually uh, transfer um, this knowledge pretty quickly to our specific domain. So yeah, check that out. There's an example in the pipeline models repo um, with steps on how to actually get it into the pipeline system and to make uh, like predictions out of this. Uh, okay, so yeah, for, for those of you raising your hands, uh, just if you could put the question into the chat, uh, that would be good. The hand raising, I, I can't figure out how to actually answer someone who's raising their hand. It's something with Zoom that I can't figure out. Um, we've also added more examples. So if you recall last month, we uh, supported MLflow, and that's that's really the heart of our experiment tracking is MLflow, a, a project from my uh, former company, Databricks. Um, and Eric actually went off and built a scikit-learn uh, sample, um, you know, which is very, very common, very accessible by most folks on this uh, specific webinar, um, right? Like we all have scikit-learn experience. This is kind of most everyone's introduction to machine learning. So, uh, you know, very good example. What Eric is showing here is for different hyperparameters, what are the different uh, right, like model metrics that were being observed um, when we train the model on the same data set? So same data set, uh, different hyperparameters led to different uh, metrics to, to measure um, the accuracy of our model or the uh, performance of our model. And so, of course, you could sort, just like Eric's done here, he, he sorted by R2. So we could see for, for the highest R2, what we needed was alpha 0 and an L1 ratio of 0 0.5. So kind of slick. Uh, this is all using MLflow. Um, so this is a, a huge part of the code base of pipelines code base that we didn't have to write, which is always my favorite. Any code that I don't have to write that gives us nice visualizations and uh, you know nicely formatted charts, uh, that's a huge win for us because uh, then we could focus on other areas of the stack. So some more visualizations down below, nice little scatter plot there, um, and then of course a link to this code in our repo and how to reproduce it. The last thing I'm pretty excited, oh, and then, yeah, Eric is actually going to do a demo on this part um, here in a sec. Let me just finish this last bit, and then I'll, I'll send it over to Eric. Um, so I'm super excited. I, I caught the privacy bug um, around uh, maybe September, October of last year where we were hearing from more and more of our enterprise customers uh, the, the need for privacy, um, specifically differential privacy, uh, which is, you know, has specific guarantees around uh, the ability, you know, to, to hide specific uh, rows of your training data, for example, right, and to prevent um, the reverse engineering of these models. So without differential privacy, you can pass in arbitrary inputs to your model and get the outputs and start to learn how the model was trained based on inputs and then outputs. With, with differential privacy, you actually, um, 
uh, yeah, so this becomes much, much harder. The problem is when you start to introduce differential privacy into your system, you now have accuracy starts to, uh, there's trade-offs with accuracy, there's trade-offs with latency. And so at uh, Pipeline, like we actually call these the three C's of machine learning, accuracy, privacy, latency. And uh, with the, the Pipeline platform, like you could actually push out new versions of your model that are, are uh, right, like using privacy, that are using different, um, degrees of privacy with like different privacy strategies and like implementations and actually compare these models live in production for their accuracy, for their latency. Um, and so uh, for us, this is a really nice uh, like use case that uh, like highlights the pipeline AI platform. Um, and so we added a privacy uh, version of the MNIST model and that's at that link below and you can actually push it out um, right into live production right alongside a non-private version of MNIST uh, next to a GPU version of MNIST next to uh, uh, XG boost version of MNIST etc and see how they're doing and this is all based on this a new library that was open sourced by Google um, which is the TensorFlow privacy uh, so yeah all of this is in the blog post um, one, one way I like to describe uh, the TensorFlow privacy um, and this concept of differential privacy is really this is becoming the new SSL of machine learning. So just like SSL is pretty much standard, uh, you know, browser communication and, and it's so ubiquitous, um, you don't even really think about it. The only time you, you think about it is when you don't have SSL um, and all of a sudden your browser shows all these, you know, warnings and, you know, potential, uh, right, like scary messages um, that you're not using SSL. And one thing I'm envisioning either later this year or in the next, um, you know, two or three years is we will all start to be warned when we are being... Uh, when our applications are being powered by non-private models. So this is a, 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 a bit extreme because this took SSL, you know, years and years to get to this point where, where browsers are, you know, really highlighting this stuff. And, um, but think of a day when you log into a site and we're making recommendations, that site is making recommendations or predictions using a non-private model and being warned about this, saying, you know, right, like, do you want to continue knowing that, uh, you know, these predictions and your data is being used in a non-private manner? So, um, yeah, uh, sort of interesting thing to think about there. So uh, keep an eye on, on these privacy. There's, there's really not too, too much online about differential privacy. Um, there's a few podcasts that, are, that I found that are good. Um, I could probably augment, um, you know, maybe add a comment to this blog post where I found that. But uh, the the key idea is, um, so like one example that, that really highlights differential privacy for me anyway is if someone comes up to you and asks you, who did you vote for? And, you know, Trump or uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, if, if you're not comfortable telling them the direct answer, which you shouldn't be, you know, these days, these models are being trained directly and there's ways to figure out who you voted for, uh, sort of after the fact, right? Um, if you're not using differential privacy. So now if someone asks you, you would flip a coin and if it's heads, you would tell them the, the truth. If it's, uh, tails, you, um, would flip the coin again and either tell them, to, you know, so there's there's a bit of indirection in your answer. And so the general idea is when you ask enough people, so there's enough data and you've collected all this data, there's ways to actually subtract out um, that uh, like potential um, you know, margin um, of unconfidence or, yes, I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, really doing this justice. These uh, podcasts and these blog posts explain it much, much better. But basically, instead of directly answering uh, these questions, um, which, which feeds into training these models, what you could do is add a little bit of sort of randomness into your answer. And with enough data, you could subtract out that randomness and end up with uh, 
a, a still you know fairly accurate model, right? Like you might lose two to five percent, something like that. Um, but yeah, so these are are the reasons that you would use pipeline is to actually train different versions of these models, put them live, and and see um, uh, really how well they can hold up in the wild. So yeah, check it out. The term is called differential privacy. Uh, and, you know, certainly <clears throat> brings back some, some thoughts of uh, the old statistics days and, and ways to do these things at scale that, that still let you keep your uh, model accurate, but also private. There's also different thresholds. There's different, um, I believe it's like epsilon is like one of the variables that you pass in during um, your privacy training. So what it comes down to is it's actually a different optimizer. Uh, that is built that has this sort of randomness built into it and so that's very important um, and you can tune that uh, parameter epsilon um, to give a little bit more privacy a little bit less privacy and find the right balance um, okay so let's see let me get uh, Eric on the line here let me see, Eric, I have to make you, uh, uh, okay, I've allowed you to talk, which means something. Hello? And yeah, we can hear you. And then I just promoted you to a panelist, so I think you can share the screen. So Eric's gonna cover um, his work, his recent work, actually just in the last couple of days on uh, the ML flow and scikit-learn. Um, yeah, Eric, maybe can you show the flower classifier, um, uh, just some of the code behind it, uh, right? Like that demo is not, not working specifically, but if you want to talk about that, that'd be cool as well. Okay. So let me stop the share and pick it up there, Eric. And again, this is being recorded, so we'll be posting this. All right. Uh, do you want me to do the, the wine one first? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Cool. So this is a simple demonstration of just MLflow. Um, this is a simple Python code that it makes a linear regression model based on the CSV file of like a bunch of uh, data about wine. So it takes in all these columns of data and then it tries to make a prediction on the quality of the wine, which ranges from three to nine. And so to run it, you would simply just do Python and then run the example. And then you can pass in these two hyperparameters. The first one is alpha and then the second one is L1. And so what it does is it takes in these hyperparameters and it split, first of all, it splits the CSV file into a 75% training and then 25% testing. And then it takes in the alpha and L1 hyperparameters it uses that to train the model and then it predicts it and then it spits out these three values which tells you the root mean squared error, the uh, mean average error, and also the R2 value. So if you just run it real quick with say 0.3 and 0.6, that'll spit out these values over here. And then what you can do is you can run MLflow UI, which will start, which will allow you to visualize a thing on their UI. So you can see these are all the runs that I did in the past. And you can see the alpha values here and the L1 ratio values here. And then it'll, you can sort these um, based on what you wanna see. So if you want the highest root mean squared error or the lowest one, you can see. And then another thing you can do is you can compare all of them. And you can get this nice visual that'll plot um, the x-axis, which you can choose between the hyperparameters, and also the y-axis, which you can see is the metrics. So you get this nice visualization of how the parameters affect um, the outcome. And another cool thing you can do is you can run uh, this PyFunk serve, which is which you can pass in the model that you just created and also the port. 
And so with this model, you can actually pass in um, data to the model and that'll give you a live prediction of what it thinks. So you can pass in this example, which is pretty much like a row in the CSV file. And if you run this, that'll spit out the prediction for the, um, based on this data. And so that's the example for the wine quality one. They also have this example for, uh, for an image classifier. This one is specifically for flowers. Um, it's kind of similar that you, instead of running a single file, you can run um, this uh, flower classifier, which has uh, an ML project. Basically with this ML project, it allows you to define, um, it lets you like set up everything to be able to run. And after training this um, model, you can similarly set up another PyFunk server and then pass in the model. And then you can score um, your own images um, based on the model that you just created. And currently I have yet to, well, I've tried testing the, um, the model, but it doesn't seem to be working too great right now, but I'll look more into that. So I think that is it with MLflow. Cool. Yeah, and I think um, my guess is that dot slash my images to score, you, you probably pass uh, a directory full of images and it'll pick it up and score them to test mm -hmm. batch scoring. Yeah, yeah, so cool. Okay, um, yeah, and then Eric also helped out with the Airflow, Kubernetes. Uh, what else did you work on, Eric? Uh, a little bit of Spark and OAuth. The Spark, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Getting OAuth into the REST API for pipeline and then Spark on Kubernetes, that's right. Yeah, this has been a productive little uh, stint for you, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably didn't get much fun at, uh, like during the break, but we appreciate it. <laughs> okay, um, thanks Eric. And the example for, uh, oh. Yeah, my Siri is like talking to me. Hey Siri, stop. <laughs> um, uh, for the code for, okay, so the flower classifier is not yet in our code base, but you're adding the other one into the code base, right? The simpler yes. model? Okay, and there's a link in the blog post to that with instructions on how to get it running. We found a few gotchas with the um, like ML flow stuff, uh, like not to use Conda in, in certain places and uh, and what, don't run ML flow in the directory it was installed in and things yeah, like that. Yeah, the UI. Cool. Okay, so let's open it up for questions here. A um, couple people, someone said, so adding salt is similar to differential privacy. Yeah, that, that's kind of a good way to, to think of it. I'm sure there's something statistical that's not uh, similar to the, the salt um, uh, like reference, but the key is you can introduce randomness and then at scale uh, with enough data, you can subtract out that randomness. If you introduce um, that randomness on two or three uh, you know, rows of, of training data, that, that is not like an effective way to use and like to achieve differential privacy. A um, couple questions. Okay, someone asked, yeah, Chuba's asking about uh, training in Virginia. Um, yeah, yeah, probably, I'll probably be doing more webinar stuff because um, I'm being uh, sort of pinned down to San Francisco for the next um, six months as we do more fundraising and more, um, you know, customer acquisition here in the Bay Area. But uh, yeah, yeah, definitely try to be, to do more stuff online to capture um, across the globe. Okay, Jeremy asks, uh, wrapping up. Um, so Jeremy's asking every framework, every hardware uh, for entity with on-prem bare metal. Yes, so pipeline runs bare metal. Um, this is actually one of our core tenants. So 
we can run um, yeah any cloud any on-prem environment as well uh, so we as long as we can get to a kubernetes cluster somewhere um, which you know really just requires docker uh, and docker images and um, you know apt get install kind of thing to get the kubernetes stuff on there so we we run wherever kubernetes runs uh, we we made that choice about two years ago, and uh, it, we certainly feel that we've made the right choice. We can run like pretty much anywhere now. Uh, so I think the the short answer there is we run on prem for sure. Okay, FMS uh, real time. It's real time. So where's the best case and for invoking very simple models? Right. So the question is. Oh, and. Uh, uh, so like related to the previous point, yes, we run on uh, like OpenShift. That's, yeah, that's certainly the obvious one. Um, very, very Kubernetes friendly. And uh, uh, we work with the Red Hat guys actually pretty closely on some of the early Kubernetes. Istio um, is one other framework that we use on top of Kubernetes that, that handles some of our traffic routing and our metrics gathering, things like that our uh, like service mesh. Um, so EFMS, you're focused on real time. Yeah, and you know, by real time, we mean, um, you know, not necessarily heart, heart uh, you know, uh, monitoring real time, but certainly much, much faster than batch. Uh, so end-to-end -end latency, you know, this certainly depends on the type of, of models that, that you're deploying. Um, one of our, our uh, value props is we can take your really, really deep, um, you know, 500 layered like deep learning models and actually like modify them, what we call post-training optimizations. So you train it, um, you know, as you wish with 500 layers and it, it does very well offline accuracy, but it's taking 15 seconds per prediction. So we can actually take that model and generate, you know, um, like 10 to 12 different variations of that model. Um, let me actually pull up, yeah, I like pulling up our pitch deck because it actually summarizes things pretty well. Yeah, so one other area that, that we've been focusing on is this sort of vertical cloud, this like industry cloud. Um, you know, one of our, our early customers is Halliburton and they have an oil and gas uh, sort of vertical industry cloud. And um, we've been seeing more and more people coming to us along these lines, which is, yes, they, they know about Amazon SageMaker and SageMaker lets you train models and lets you push, you know, models into production. Uh, but they actually need something that works across all three clouds or OpenShift on-prem. So um, we're, we're actually kind of setting up to become the, the standard, you know, sort of SageMaker for these like multi-cloud uh, type of scenarios. So just to give you guys kind of an idea, there's uh, currently, you know, two, I'm, I'm sure there's like many more, but the ones that, that pop into my head is GE Edison and Salesforce Einstein. These are really AI specific components within these vertical clouds. So Salesforce is obviously, you know, CRM, um, uh, sales leads, you know, prospects, things like that. Uh, they have a tool called Einstein that helps you predict which leads are worth going after. Um, same with, you know, GE Edison, um, which is kind of their like machine learning, their sort of sage maker for, for their uh, vertical cloud. Uh, here's the familiar three C's, accuracy, privacy, latency. The key is to experiment. Um, the core thought here, and this is something I learned firsthand at uh, like Netflix, which is you really can't predict offline, or sorry, you can't, there's only so much you can do offline. And not until you actually put these models online with live traffic can you really start to uh, get a feel for their performance characteristics. Um, also, there was this recent blog post that I tweeted about from Amazon. Um, and at first, I was super excited to read this post because it, it was, you know, how do you use SageMaker to train models and continuously deploy them and to continuously train them? Um, the you know link to the blog post is down at the bottom here. Um, it's pretty easy to like Google for. It's a pretty recent blog post from 
uh, just maybe two weeks ago. Uh, but the funny thing was, as I was reading this blog post, which is about 19 pages, it's, it's showing you all of these services that you need to use within Amazon. You know, you, you, you of course have to use SageMaker, you then have to use the step functions and the Fargate and the, um, you know, I, I'm sure Beanstalk was in there somewhere and Amazon Glue and uh, the Amazon Workflow. So there's about seven or eight like different services that you need to stitch together. There, there was Lambdas, of course. Um, I think EMR, the Elastic MapReduce was in there somewhere as well too, just to do what Pipeline does with one button. And um, so I kind of jokingly tweeted, I was like, uh, this blog post is the exact reason I created Pipeline AI, which uh, I like a lot of people laughed and thought that was silly. Um, but, you know, really this is the problem here. And the more and more services that you're using and the more stitching um, that you need to do, uh, like the more you are locked into a particular cloud vendor. The other problem is not all these, these cloud vendors have these uh, services. So, you know, some of them have, are in different stages of their Lambda, their function support. Um, and so uh, if you stitch together one way for one cloud, you, you have to stitch together some uh, like completely different way with another cloud. And so, you know, Pipeline is very AI focused and is meant to do what this blog post is describing, but with just a single button. Um, back to the sort of model optimization. So, uh, you know, I, and I think I'm, I'm addressing this question here, but um, like performance wise, the first version of the model that, that you put out is likely optimized for accuracy and it's, it is not optimized for online prediction. So we can actually generate like multiple versions and, you know, variants of the original model with like different run times. We could try GPU, we could try Tensor RT, um, you know, by the NVIDIA folks. Uh, if, if we have access to the NVIDIA GPUs and, you know, really, really find the right balance for you. So we can not only find the right balance, but we could actually create new variations that are the right balance. And we, we could even, if you have access to all three clouds, we can even deploy these across all clouds, find the fastest GPU, the most economical, um, you know, uh, um, right, like training scenarios and uh, model serving scenarios, model prediction scenarios. So yeah, by real time, and we also do real-time training as well. So as new labeled data is coming in, you know, let's say you've got a fleet of people that are in Slack or, you know, using uh, the Amazon, uh, right, like Mechanical Turk, and they're uh, like labeling data like crazy. We can actually push new, um, right, like newer versions of the model in real time. So you know, meaning every um, like minute, for example, we could be pushing out. So. While this is more discrete sort of real time, because we're not actually changing anything in production, we're just generating new versions based on the latest data and then pushing them out alongside. And we push models out in um, a shadow mode. So this is something, of course, we did back at, uh, like, at, you know, at like places like Netflix and you know, friends of ours, places at uh, Facebook. There's, there's shadow mode that you push things out. It's still getting traffic, but it's not actually returning the prediction back to the user. It's more um, for internal purposes, we can look at how these models are doing relative to each other and then determine the best and then push the best live. Um, very simple models. So typically, yeah, we, we let you, um, you know, so like here's examples here, like you can see models that are returning in nine milliseconds, uh, you know, the 99.5 percentile, 14 milliseconds, all the way up to 110 milliseconds. I thought there was one, yeah, 162 milliseconds. So really this, it depends on how deep your model is. It depends on how many optimizations we can, um, apply to your model. If you give us an R model, there's not much we can do. If you give us a scikit model, there's a couple things we can do. If you give us TensorFlow or uh, you know something like MXNet, which is more ML 3.0, we call it, there's tons of things we can do to these models to actually uh, get the best performance. We can also make the model smaller so that they fit on small devices. Um, and 
Yeah, the other key thing is it's this unified runtime. So you can compare Scikit to uh, TensorFlow, to Java, um, to Spark. Uh, and these are the, the typical user is either application developer, data scientist, or um, the sort of unicorn ML engineer. We're most proud of the app developers. You know, most ML platforms are targeted towards data scientists and model training. We're actually targeted um, sort of equally to, you know, optimization from the ML engineer, uh, sort of productionization by, and consumption by the app developer, uh, and then the rapid experimentation by the data scientist. So yeah, GitHub stars climbing, um, community users going up. This is more just, uh, that's more the business model and some other stuff. So this is actually pretty interesting. This is um, showing the addressable market. So for example, Netflix, it, you know, they have about 3,000 servers that are making predictions. These are $2.30 per hour servers. This is just a bit into the specifics of our business model, but um, you know, I figure some of you guys might appreciate this. Uh, Netflix uses M M5 12XLs, um, and we charge 30% markup on the EC2 instance. Um, to compare, by the way, SageMaker is about uh, 45 to 50% to markup. Um, Databricks is about 44% markup, and Databricks only does uh, training. It actually doesn't do any productionization. Um, and yeah, so there's, you know, big, big, huge MRR. Um, and then some of the, the smaller um, sort of early lines of business customers are, you know, at, at 48 servers, smaller servers, things like that. So um, here's a bit about competition as well, too, in case, since we're in this slide anyway. Uh, there's this sort of reference architecture called Kubeflow. Um, it's a bit fragmented. It's it's pretty well supported, you know, by the open source community, but, but not really any single commercial um, uh, uh, like vendor is supporting it. It still requires heavy customization and it's kind of stuck on certain versions of things and they have their own opinions, but it's a good place to start. Uh, we, we pull in Kubeflow components when um, we, we find them to be mature enough or to be adopted, um, but we still like to use Airflow, for example. Um, Kubeflow uses something else called Argo. That's a, a new project out of Intuit. Uh, that's Kubernetes native, um, you know. So now that we have Airflow working with Kubernetes, we're we're back uh, into Airflow land again because that's what all of our customers use. Um, cloud providers, they have SageMaker. You know, obviously, I, I showed the the slide before. To really make SageMaker work, you have to stitch in about you know ten to fifteen other services. Um, there's other companies too that are focused more on ML AI ops. So. Company timeline, we built the basic infrastructure 2017, 2018 was really about the real-time model optimization, experiment tracking. Um, also last year we focused on community edition. We wanted to give people something to touch and feel and to give us feedback and tell us what they like and not like. Uh, we also started a bunch of POCs. Um, we're still accepting POCs, by the way, if you guys are interested. Uh, just shoot us a note at uh, sales at pipeline or contact at uh, pipeline AI. Um, and then this year, it's really about workflows and sort of backing into some of these uh, more traditional batch, but with the goal of um, you know making them more real time batch uh, rather than just kind of off the shelf or sort of offline batch. A um, couple other things here, so. Yeah, hardware optimizations, detecting bias. Um, we did a survey end of last year about things that you might find interesting about pipeline or what, what people have been finding interesting. We got 500 uh, solid responses back here. We trimmed out a bunch of the, you know, um, the ones that seemed like they were just fake uh, responses. So, you know, really it's time to deploy new models and uh, the ability to manage a large number of these models in live production, the ability to detect bias and decay. So this is model monitoring, really, um, sort of real-time monitoring. Uh, the ability to auto-optimize. So this is generating new variants of the models. And then also the ability to route traffic across the clouds to find. So let's picture you lose your um, sort of less expensive spot instances on Amazon. 
And now what do you do? Now we find out that actually Google is now cheaper for the same instance type. So we shift traffic slowly over to the Google uh, cloud. And then when we get the spot instances back, we can then, you know, migrate traffic back to Amazon and sort of, uh, really arbitrage cost across all of um, these cloud providers. Also, the other thing that we're focused on for 2019 is making this a truly one-click install. Um, so we're you know working on uh, scripts to make this faster, much easier to start using. Um, even in our UI, we have the Save As button, which is kind of mocked out for right now, but. Um, when you click Save As uh, coming up here soon, you'll actually be able to spin up your own cluster um, on, on your own cloud account, uh, which is what people want. People don't want us to host their, their data or their machine learning models. They want to be able to host them themselves. And so we're certainly uh, working towards that. This is a deployment mechanism that folks like Databricks use, um, which has been uh, Fairly high touch, but you know, um, once it's it's automated, it's actually pretty easy to stamp out. So that's what we're currently working towards. Um, and also, just want to highlight the flexible add-on capabilities of a platform like Pipeline AI. So while right now we're focused more on the basics, just because that's what's most needed. You know, just just getting models out there, just getting models, um, you know, optimized and tuned from the lab into production. But also, we're starting to work more because we're actually owning the prediction, um, uh, like request response. We can actually start to explain these models in real time. We can actually ensemble or combine models into, into a, a single prediction. Uh, it is often called ensembling or composing models. Um, of course, online model training uh, and tracking these like real-time prediction metrics. This is something we we do right now, but people always want to know something more, or they 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 want to add in uh, specific auto scaling uh, triggers where they want to auto scale on the depth of the request queue, for example, um, you know, or they just have custom metrics that they want to use. So we're exposing all that through our functions capability, you know, sort of serverless capability, um, you know, uh, uh, right, like pipeline lambdas basically. Um, and let's see, so I think that's it. Let me double check. So the question is, how is this different than Kubeflow? Right, so Kubeflow is, is more of a reference architecture, um, whereas you know, we're, we're a real production uh, product. Um, you can certainly use Kubeflow, just like you can set up your own Spark cluster um, and not use Databricks. You know, this is something I dealt with a lot when I was at Databricks in the early days. People would, would come up to our conference booth and say, you know, why do we need to use Databricks when I can run my own Spark cluster? And that's certainly the case. You could certainly run your own Kubeflow. Um, just know that, you know, Kubeflow, because of its scope, which is really end to end, uh, it's a beast. And there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of uh, potential incompatibilities with versions. Uh, this is one thing I've heard. Um, yeah, so right, like we love Kubeflow, like we know those guys really well. Um, we pull in certain things, like most recently we we pulled in um, their hyperparameter tuning, uh, and it's a part of our stack that we started to build. We saw Kubeflow has already built it or is starting to build it, so we pulled it in there. Same with like MLflow, actually the experiment tracking. We we started on our path of building our own experiment tracking, and then realized uh, this is this is you know much larger than we thought it was going to be. We heard about MLflow um, from my old Databricks colleagues and decided to wait and to work with them on that. Uh, it's a big chunk of code that we don't have to write and um, somebody else can write, can uh, test it, maintain it, yeah, all that stuff. Um, yeah, so Yefam's asking about uh, best case rest scenario. I mean, we've seen under one millisecond for, um, you know, this then gets into, uh, do you use REST, do you use gRPC for your predictions? Um, you know, then it comes down to more what, which protocol are you using, which cloud provider, uh, who has the fastest networking, are you in CDNs? One thing, we've been working with Cloudflare recently to deploy JavaScript TensorFlow um, and, you know, on their 
their edge network. So really these, these predictions end up being as close to where the predictions are being made as possible because of Cloudflare's extensive content delivery network where content in this case is uh, a TensorFlow model written in JavaScript. So we're excited about that. We've been seeing really, really low latency. Um, Let's see, cloud stickiness to hinder multi-cloud. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you have, when you're you're so tied to all these different cloud services, you now and you know to be very honest with you, coming from Netflix, we were always talking about multi-cloud, but really Netflix is tied to Amazon, and I think we all know that they have a couple projects on Google and you know uh, possibly using uh, like Azure for some like redundancy type scenarios, but. Once you're you're tied to a particular cloud, you're you know tied to that cloud, and you you just have to trust that they're not going to charge you extra, or that they'll continue to lower prices and work with you, um, and not you know like treat it like a monopoly. But um, we our early cases, our early customers do require multi-cloud because they themselves are platforms. You know these these vertical cloud providers that are, are usually industry leaders in their vertical, right? Like Halliburton, like GE, um, like Salesforce. So these folks are uh, like dominant. They have customers that run on Azure, that run on uh, like Amazon and run on Google or run on on-prem and they need consistency with their machine learning. And so that's exactly where we uh, fall in. Okay, a um, couple, let's see, I think we have time for well, it's the top of the hour, but let me just skim through here, see if there's transfer learning, chopping, how can your infrastructure be used to incrementally train, not deep learning, rather traditional models? Yeah, so um, deep learning networks are very, very uh, friendly with continuous training, just the way that they use lots of data and each neuron you know, picks up a tiny bit of the overall model, but really it's the network that matters. So. The, the question here is, yes, you could do this with neural networks. How do you do this with more traditional models? So um, the linear models, right, like logistic regression, um, like linear classifiers, these things are very, very well set up for the incremental model training. Um, and in fact, scikit-learn has a lesser known uh, mechanism to do partial uh, like underscore fit. So it, and it's mostly on these like linear models where you see the method partial underscore fit, um, which is similar to fit, but fit is, you know, being your, when you call fit on a scikit-learn model, you're giving it all of the data. When you call partial fit on a scikit-learn model, specifically these linear models that support it, you're just giving it sort of incremental bits of the overall model and the internals of that partial fit uh, right, like implementation actually can um, right, like handle just like the incremental case. So it, it's essentially not trusting that you're giving it all the data and you know, therefore just sort of incrementally uh, modifying the weights. <clears throat> and so yes, this can be done with the pipeline infrastructure um, for both neural networks and for uh, traditional linear models as well too. Um, Targeting app, uh, targeting app developers, um, saying there was an app developer's job to figure out how to pass parameters to invoke. Yeah, so one of the things we're, we're focusing on in 2019 is to reduce the cognitive load on the application developer. Um, it's, we, the, the most basic glue code, as you point out here, is REST. Um, and when REST is not fast enough, uh, we then have to kind of get in um, into some of the details and expose either the Java bindings or the, the C bindings. Um, so right now we're, we're sticking with REST and gRPC, um, you know, mainly because these are just the industry standards and they're the most uh, sort of interoperable or interchangeable. Um, but we are seeing cases where, yeah, we need much, much lower integration and we're kind of handling those right now on a one-off uh, basis uh, to the, and to parse the results and to handle errors. Yeah. And there's a little bit of negotiation that happens between the data scientist who's the producer of these models and, and the application developer who's the consumer. 
um, a, about which errors they're going to throw. And while we have standard, you know, platform errors, there are always cases where there's specific errors that are specific to the model that we do want to um, expose. So, yeah, that's just classic software uh, development, software, um, you know, architecting. Um, Let's see, are, the, are all the architectural components real-time batch processing deployed as containers? Yeah, so we're 100% container-based, um, which gives us the portability across the clouds and on-prem. Um, you know, once again, thanks to uh, the Kubernetes uh, community, and fortunately we, we chose Kubernetes early enough where we've kind of, um, we know all of the ins and outs of uh, that particular architectural decision. Um, yeah, sharing the slides, I could do that. This is our pitch deck, so I have to kind of trim them out a little bit. Um, what are, so, but this video will be posted, and I'll try to get some of the slides posted to uh, the other places, slideshare.pipeline.ai. Differential privacy, what do you do in your infrastructure in terms of training knowledge develop cannot be invoked by a colleague? What security message? Right, so um, there... Within the actual app itself, uh, you can, so yeah, this is something that's actually actively being worked on because the default uh, for last year was that these models are open to the entire enterprise. Uh, for, for the most part, that's been okay, but we are now seeing cases where we like do want uh, to apply authorization um, and specific ACLs to specific models. Um, and that extends throughout the entire product. So that's not just notebooks. You know, you don't want other people to see your specific notebooks or to execute your experiments. But um, yes, access to these model predictions. So for full disclosure, we're not quite there yet. The ability to protect um, right now, you have to do it at the sort of network level or the uh, the sort of ingress level, right? So, um, but certainly um, we've we've just added. Uh, you know, off to all of our like REST APIs um, and all of our UI, obviously, uh, it's been there for the UI for a while. That was something Eric worked on over the holidays, um, but we still have one more step. Uh, certain customers do want complete isolation so that one colleague cannot call somebody else's uh, model, and that, that's something that still needs to be worked through. Yeah, and audit and logging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's, yeah, so this is all uh, tied to the same thing. Right now, we actually are logging um, all of, uh, we are using Jaeger for the tracing. You know, these are our familiar off the shelf, uh, like open source tools. Um, and right now, we've got a project in place that's actually uh, going to let you search and expose those logs to the uh, type of user that like requests that type of info. So, you know, more the like admin user, not necessarily the uh, just regular data scientist or regular application developer. But yes, we do have an audit um, and also searching the logs as well too. Of course, we use uh, the EFK stack, we use Elasticsearch, we use FluentD and we use Kibana. Um, so all of those are all, you know, familiar uh, tools to people. Um, also, we, of course, use Grafana, we use Prometheus. These are all, you know, CNCF projects pretty much that all work together really well. Um, and yes, anytime we can use anything off the shelf like that, we are more than happy to do it with some minor customizations for security or for uh, the specific AI focus. So, okay, guys, thanks for um, all the questions. And if you have any more, just hit me up on uh, Slack. Uh, there's a bunch of us on there so we can answer. And I'll be posting this as soon as uh, Zoom can download and uh, convert it. So talk to you all soon. See you next month. Uh, and look for the video on YouTube. YouTube.pipeline.ai. Take care.